Why, hello, fellow Patriots, and welcome to episode 14 on the Patriot Dad channel, where we can focus on current events and modern issues, all while keeping it as real as possible. Today, I wanted to talk to you about the complicated history between Russia, also known as the former Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or USSR, and NATO. Is one side really the good guy and the other the bad guy? Is it really that simple? Are there actions on both sides that have been taken that make the situation worse. Share your thoughts on your initial opinions below in the comments. But before we get started on today's video, a quick word about our merch store and the opportunities there to snag a deal. Go ahead and head over to our website, seen here, and scroll all the way to the bottom and enter your email here to join our email list. There is currently an ongoing promotion for 10% off your entire first order for new email subscribers. As a member of the email list, you will also be able to take advantage of future promotions and a future newsletter that will be coming soon, where we will feature links to other resources, promotions, discounts, and ads for merchandise and other items that fit with our brand. So go ahead and go to the headquarters website, sign up for the email list, and take advantage of that 10% off your entire first order. I look forward to seeing you around the headquarters, Patriots. Bye for now. And now, Back to our week's video. For now, the USSR, also known as now Russia, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, their main contention with NATO comes out of the end of the Second World War. After Nazi Germany had invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, opening up the eastern front of the European theater of World War II, the USSR's Red Army pushed the German army back to Berlin. As the Red Army pushed back the Nazis, they effectively took control of the majority of Eastern Europe, turning these countries into satellite states. This invasion left Russia feeling the need for a land buffer between itself and the western parts of Europe to help prevent the recurrence of an invasion just like the German Operation Barbarossa that had threatened its existence by attacking Moscow directly. This feeling continues even to today and is the biggest point of contention that I can find at least between Russia today and the expansion of NATO eastward. First, we're gonna look at an article from NATO about the spread of the Soviet Union. And as you can see here, as the power of the Soviet Union spread to several Eastern European countries, there was concern among the Western European countries that Moscow would impose its ideology and authority across Europe. From the end of the Second World War in 1945, Western governments started reducing their defense establishments and demobilizing their forces. In January of 1948, however, British Foreign Secretary Ernst Bevin spoke of the need for a treaty of alliance and mutual assistance, a defensive alliance, and a regional grouping within the framework of the UN Charter. The United States would only agree to provide military support for Europe if it were united. In response, Belgium, France, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom signed the Brussels Treaty in March of 48, creating the Western Union. Designed to strengthen ties between the signatories while providing for a common defense, the Brussels Treaty ultimately became the basis for the Washington Treaty. The Washington Treaty that created the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, was signed in 1949. The treaty committed each member to share the risk, responsibilities, and benefits of collective defense, a concept at the very heart of the alliance. Each of the 12 founding countries on signing the treaty voluntarily committed themselves to participating in political consultations and military activities of the organization. This agreement of mutual protection cementing the lines of Eastern and Western Europe was a stalemate of sorts. However, those lines wouldn't be as solid as the USSR would have hoped. And if we look at a map of the USSR, or the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic in this map, you can see that along its western border, Russia made a boundary between itself and Western Europe using Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Belarus, Ukraine, Moldova, and then if you look to the south of the Black Sea, you have Georgia, Armenia, and if you keep going, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and the rest. And if you notice, it makes a very nice barrier between Russia and the rest of the world to the west. Next, we are going to look at a map of NATO expansion. If we look at this map, founding members are here in the darkest green, and we have Belgium, Canada, Denmark, France, 
Iceland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Portugal, the United Kingdom, and the United States. During the Cold War, that expanded to Greece, Turkey, West Germany, and Spain. Post Cold War, however, you see here that the remaining part of Germany, when it was unified, joined NATO. The Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, Bulgaria, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, Slovenia, Albania, Croatia, then Montenegro, North Macedonia, and finally Finland in 2023. If we scroll down here further, you can see here that in the years that followed, Putin grew increasingly outspoken in his displeasure at NATO's inroads into Eastern Europe, saying at a high-profile speech in Munich in 2007 that it is obvious the NATO expansion does not have any relation with the modernization of the alliance itself or with ensuring security in Europe. On the contrary, it represents a serious provocation that reduces the level of mutual trust. In the summer following NATO's 2008 Bucharest summit, where NATO stated its intent to admit Georgia and Ukraine, Russia invaded the former. So in 2008, we had an invasion of Georgia. Six years later, as Kiev stepped closer to an economic partnership with another Western bloc, the European Union, Russia invaded Ukraine and annexed Crimea. So you can see here, there's a major point of contention. And if we look back at the map really quick of the former Soviet republics, you can see that Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and these other countries, Ukraine, a lot of these Western borderlands that they were using as a land buffer have now joined NATO, pushing NATO's boundaries right up against Russia. And actions rather than words made it clear that Russia saw NATO as an adversary. Things in Ukraine started to shift in 2013 and 2014 as the Euromaidan, pardon the pronunciation, revolution caused the ouster of pro-Russian President Viktor Yanukovych. You can see here in an article from the Kyiv Independent from July of 2023, that the Euromaidan revolution is often credited with being the single most consequential event in Ukraine's modern history. After pro-Kremlin President Viktor Yanukovych took power in 2010, the political and business landscape in Ukraine was gradually deteriorating. In November of 2013, Yanukovych refused to sign the long-awaited association agreement with the European Union, shortly thereafter receiving a loan from the Kremlin. His refusal to sign the agreement sparked protests all over the country, with the largest demonstration taking place in Kyiv on Independent Square. The protests would turn into a revolution that lasted until February of 2014, ending with Yanukovych fleeing to Russia. There was also some belief that the United States and other Western allies had some influence in that revolution because it resulted in a more pro-Western government. Next, we can look at a Time article about how does Russia feel about NATO today. Tensions skyrocketed between NATO and Russia after the 2014 annexation. Now countries bordering Russia, including the Baltics, are really fearful. If they had not joined NATO and stayed neutral, they would be much more comfortable. Since 2014, Russia and NATO's relations have reverted back to their Cold War hostility. But today, the threat Russia poses is much more complex, says Rasmussen, the ex-NATO Secretary General. The security environment has transformed from a predictable bipolar confrontation to a multi-layered, non-transparent picture of threats and challenges. And finally, even countries that are geographically far from Russia, such as the Balkans, fear Russia's subtle methods of destabilization, including disinformation and cyber warfare. Now, that's not to say that the United States and its Western allies aren't also capable of disinformation. However, is our propaganda correct? Is theirs correct? Is there some truth found in the middle? What are your thoughts? The next article we have to look at looks like it could have been written recently, but it was actually from over nine years ago in 2014. You see here, this article is more than nine years old. It is not Russia that pushed Ukraine to the brink of war. This is a Guardian article, though not known to be a pro-Russia outlet. Here in 2014, we see that the threat of war in Ukraine is growing as the unelected government in Kyiv declares itself unable to control the rebellion in the country's east. John Kerry brands Russia as a rogue state. The US and European Union step up sanctions against the Kremlin, accusing it of destabilizing Ukraine. The White House is reported to be set on a new Cold War policy with the aim of turning Russia into the pariah state 
state. That might be more explicable if what is going on in eastern Ukraine now were not the mirror image of what took place in Kyiv a couple of months ago. Then it was armed protesters in Maidan Square seizing government buildings and demanding a change for government and constitution. US and European leaders championed the masked militants and denounced the elected government for its crackdown, just as they now backed the unelected government's use of force against rebels occupying police stations and town halls in cities such as Slovensk and Donetsk. America is with you, Senator John McCain told demonstrators then, standing shoulder to shoulder with the leader of the far right Svoboda party, as the U.S. ambassador haggled with the State Department over who would make up the new Ukrainian government. When the Ukrainian president was replaced by a U.S.-selected administration and an entirely unconstitutional takeover, politicians such as William Hague brazenly misled Parliament about the legality of what had taken place, the imposition of a pro-Western government on Russia's most neuralgic and politically divided neighbor. Putin bit back, taking a leaf out of the U.S. street protest playbook, even though, as in Kyiv, the protests that spread from Crimea to eastern Ukraine evidently have mass support. But what had been a glorious cry for freedom in Kyiv became infiltration and an insatiable aggression in Sevastopol and Luhansk. After Crimeans voted overwhelmingly to join Russia, the bulk of the Western media abandoned any hint of even-handed coverage. So Putin is now routinely compared to Hitler, while the role of the fascistic right on the streets and in the new Ukrainian regime has been airbrushed out of most reporting as Putin propaganda. So you don't hear much about the Ukrainian government's veneration of wartime Nazi collaborators and pogromists or arson attacks on the homes and offices of elected communist leaders or the integration of the extreme right sector into the National Guard, while the anti-Semitism and white supremacy racism of the government's ultra-nationalists is assiduously played down and false identifications of Russian special forces are relayed as fact. So you can see here there's misinformation going both ways. We have the toppling of a pro-Kremlin regime, a, an election of a Ukrainian president, a replacement of the Ukrainian president with a pro-Western government. You have a whitewashing, so to speak, of the far-right extremists in Ukraine and so many other confusing and conflicting statements and reports that it's really hard to say who is correct. If you know more, please feel free to share, because right now, more than anything, from what you hear in our media, it doesn't sound anything like this. So thank you to The Guardian and others for providing another perspective that we can talk about. The next article is from the Global Conflict Tracker. So for the war in Ukraine, armed conflict in eastern Ukraine erupted in early 2014 following Russia's annexation of Crimea. The previous year, protests in Ukraine's capital Kyiv against Ukrainian President Viktor Yanukovych's decision to reject a deal for greater economic integration with the European Union were met with a violent crackdown by state security forces. The protests widened, escalating the conflict, and President Yanukovych fled in February of 2014. Armed conflict in the regions quickly broke out between Russian-backed forces and the Ukrainian military. Russia denied military involvement, but both Ukraine and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, reported the buildup of Russian troops and military equipment near Donetsk and Russian cross-border shelling immediately following Crimea's annexation. The conflict transitioned to an active stalemate with regular shelling and skirmishes occurring along front lines separating Russian and Ukrainian-controlled eastern border regions. In April of 2016, NATO announced the deployment of four battalions to Eastern Europe, rotating troops through Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, you noticed a few of those are former Soviet Socialist Republics, to deter the possible future Russian aggression elsewhere on the continent, particularly in the Baltics. So here we are sending in more troops and resources to help prevent the spread that we say Russia is trying to make when Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania used to belong to the USSR. And if you would ask Putin, he would say they still do, or he wants to restore them. In January 2018, the United States imposed new sanctions on 21 individuals, including a number of Russian officials, and nine companies linked to the conflict in eastern Ukraine. So here we are increasing economic pressure. You go down a little bit further, 
In mid-December of 2021, Russia's foreign ministry called on the United States and NATO to cease military activities in Eastern Europe and Central Asia, commit to no further NATO expansion towards Russia, and prevent Ukraine from joining NATO in the future. This is consistent with Russia's desire to maintain a land buffer zone between Russia and the western parts of Europe. The United States and other NATO allies rejected these demands and threatened to impose severe economic sanctions if Russia took aggressive action against Ukraine. So here we are again ratcheting up pressure in December of 21. So you see this constant increase of pressure from both sides. But the person, in my opinion, that's being the most consistent here is Russia. They are trying to maintain their buffer zone between themselves and Europe. And NATO continued to push eastward. Putin claimed that the goal of the special military operation was to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine and end the alleged genocide of Russians in Ukrainian territory. Now, I think we can all agree that human suffering in general is a negative thing and should be minimized to the greatest extent possible. Is this conflict as plain black and white as we're led to believe? Did both sides take actions that escalated to a conflict irresponsibly? Did NATO violate its agreement with Russia to preserve the land buffer between Russia and Europe? Did Russia really need to be as aggressive as they were in preserving their perceived safety buffer? Share your thoughts or opinions in the comments below. I'm sure there's feelings on both sides. This conflict is not just a conflict of governments, it's a conflict that's affecting all of the peoples involved. War in general is an increase in human suffering and should be avoided unless it is the option of less human suffering. Sometimes that is the case, but most of the time it isn't. So why is it that the West is so adamantly against a political or negotiated solution to this conflict? Is our media being honest with us? While our media is considered freer than most, is it informative and accurate, or is it still misleading and divisive? We can see here that a negotiated settlement is probably off the table. This is an article from NPR of February of 2023. Analysts broadly agree that a diplomatic deal to end the conflict looks like a non-starter. Why would a political solution and a negotiated solution ever be a non-starter? Putin already chagrined by his military's poor performance and what he's billed as a special military operation cannot afford to be seen as backing out of a fight that he started and by his own estimates should have been able to win easily. For Zelensky, the stakes are at least as high. A survey of Ukrainians in September showed they are steadfast in rejecting territorial concessions to Russia. Any sort of ceasefire without Russian military defeat basically means regrouping, says Mikhail Alexiev, a political science professor at San Diego State University whose research is currently focused on the war in Ukraine. That would result in further attacks down the line. So you can see here that a lot of the language surrounding this current conflict is not aimed at resolving the conflict, it's looking for the total defeat of Russia. And since we've already pushed Russia into a corner that made them feel the need to lash out in the first place, does continuing to corner them serve the greater interest? Is our ego and our unwillingness to let people choose a different form of government than we agree with really worth continued human suffering? Are we really on the right side? Does the US even have a side worth taking in this conflict? Should we let Europe decide what happens in Europe, or should we continue to get involved? Has NATO or the UN outlived their usefulness? Why is the United States, the primary funder with blood and treasure to these organizations. I mean, any of these questions would probably be a video unto themselves. And if you would like to see it, just let me know in the comments below. I think in general, we should all just be praying for a reduction in human suffering in whatever form that takes, even if that means negotiating a settlement. Thank you for watching this week's video. It was interesting to say the least to do the research and look at the actual history between Russia and NATO. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment below. If you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to get notified of when I upload new content. Please share the video and feel free to leave a comment below if you have a recommendation for a future video or if you have an opinion about today's content. Following today's topic, next week we're going to be looking at who the good guys really are. Do the good guys really exist? Take care everyone. God bless and bye for now.
Go ahead and check out one of the links on the screen now to either subscribe to the channel and see the rest of the videos of the channel or one of the carefully selected videos that you may wish to see that YouTube has used its algorithm to select for you.